<laughs> let's start with let's start with the story. Uh, everyone's got a story how they got into the field. So okay. what's yours? I like this one. Yeah, that one's pretty easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I actually um, I was doing my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh, and I was really fascinated with children with speech impediments and audiology, sign language, those sorts of things. Um, I did a certificate in American Sign Language, so I was really interested in that area. And our undergrad program, our advisor was originally from Ireland and we did a study abroad trip to um, Dublin, Belfast and a couple cool. other places. It was really awesome. And while we were there, we visited a lot of special schools um, and a lot of institutes for children with um, speech delays and audiology, um, sign language, stuff like that. And on one day specifically, we visited a center for children with autism. Mm -hmm. So we really got to learn about, you know, the sensory issues, the communication difficulties, uh, language impairments, all those sorts of things. And in a way, we kind of got to uh, live a day in the life of a child with autism. Okay. And I just absolutely loved it. Um, and then I decided from there to not pursue um, SLP or audiology. I decided to go for early intervention with autism specialization. Mm -hmm. So during my master's program, we got, I think we had to do like the main classes to, to do the ABA certificate in order to uh, get the hours to sit for the BCBA exam. And so during that time too, I just, I fell in love with behavior analysis um, and early intervention and working with kids with autism. And from there, just kind of everything happened. I finished my master's in Pittsburgh and I was looking for jobs around the US. Um, I always wanted to end up in Europe, um, more specifically Ireland, just because I kind of fell in love with um, the profession there. So I looked into Ireland, England, and Norway, and um, one of my professors kind of tipped me on looking at, um, at this university. So I reached out and they were very interested in interviewing the whole process and the rest was kind of history yeah. and I ended up over here. So what so. are some of the areas that you're researching now? So right now I'm specifically researching uh, two conditional discrimination training procedures for teaching children receptive lab uh, labeling. Mm -hmm. So a lot of research um, has been done with that with uh, Laura Grow, who's now in Fresno, California. Also, uh, Joseph Adore, he's in like the Massachusetts area. And then um, my advisor, Svein Eikeset, has also done um, one or two studies on that area. So right now we're looking at, again, um, looking at the two different procedures, uh, the structured mix versus the random rotation procedure. And if there's really any difference between children with um, more advanced language repertoires mm -hmm. or more limited language repertoires. So. Where, where's the research falling so far? Like, what can you say about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am about to hopefully submit my first article um, in the next couple of weeks. Congrats. So maybe you'll have to wait. I'm yeah. just kidding. Um, no, but I guess right now we're kind of seeing, and everyone, I guess, who works in the field knows that working with children with disabilities or children with autism, every child is individual mm -hmm. and it's just going to depend on their learning history, their motivation, um, maybe the person who's training with them, the sorts of stimuli you're training with them. Mm -hmm. So we're looking that it, or seeing that it's very individualized um, and it's also potentially maybe more of a structured mix procedure mm -hmm. is better for a child with a limited language repertoire versus maybe a child who has more skills. They don't need that structure and that repetition and they can go in more with um, a wider array of stimuli to be taught so cool. so it's coming out soon yes so hopefully <laughs> it's always that constant back and forth with edits between your advisors and your co-advisors so yeah. we're aiming for the next couple weeks and cool. then yep so awesome we'll see so uh your transition from here so you had a master's program in the states you come over here for your phd lots of people wonder like what are the differences between the states and here we were talking before as mm -hmm. you said um both kind of have their own struggles and different things that they're handling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think, I mean, in both countries, I think you have, you know, strengths and advantages based on the, like the healthcare system, um, the 
uh, higher population of people with specific needs and also uh, staff and education. So I think that makes a big difference coming from the States where it's obviously a higher population of individuals than in Norway. Um, The big thing that I realized when I got here, when I was studying for the BCBA exam, was that there's only, I think, five of us who have our BCBAs in all of Norway versus when you look at each state in the U.S., there's thousands. Yeah. So looking at that and the difference there and just um, who is available to provide those services. But there's a lot higher of a concentration of behavior analysts when you look at it per capita here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting difference. It is an interesting difference, so. Cool, so what else is different between the two and the struggles? I would say... In the States, I worked very closely with um, colleagues and professionals who were specifically working with children with autism or mm-hmm. disabilities. Um, here, it's there's a, just like a wider array of professionals. Yeah. So within our program specifically, we have people who are working with children with autism, people who are working with neuroscience, so they're in like the rat labs and working um, those sorts of areas. And then you also have, you know, OBM, cultural selection, stimulus yeah. equivalents, eye tracking. So it's very, it's very different from um, colleague to colleague. So it's really interesting to have those conversations, especially with some of my colleagues who have no experience with children with autism and they're coming to me to ask me these questions. And then, you know, I don't really have a, mm-hmm. a, a tight grasp maybe on OBM or cultural selection in those areas. So I think it's it's very interesting and it opens up more doors for collaborations within other professions when you have that sort of environment around you. Yeah. And to kind of piggyback off that, you've had some cool opportunities for teaching elsewhere, right? Not yeah. even here, yeah, but yeah. like in totally different countries. So what Definitely. were those like? So it was it was great. So I did an Erasmus exchange in uh, in Stockholm last semester. So I got to work with their special education department, and then uh, this this fall I'll be in Scotland teaching with um, their special education department. But I'll actually be teaching with I'm pretty sure the nursing program. So I haven't been there yet, so I don't know all the details. But yeah. it just opens up more doors to you know collaborating with other universities who maybe don't have. A, um, a tight grasp or like a big um, behavior analysis community. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to have, you know, the support here and to be able to go to other universities and to teach their bachelor's or their master's students and also collaborate with other researchers in those yeah. areas. And you're another one that you just reminded me of when we were talking uh, for this was the independence and the kind of like flow of the program from day to day. Mm-hmm. Sounds like it's totally different than it's, how it's in the States, yeah. right? Yes. Like we had regimented like, here's yeah. what you're doing when. Mm-hmm. And y'all are just kind of, yeah, go for it. Exactly. It so the there's a lot more independence and a lot more responsibility on you as an individual um, student. So technically, we're we're hired here as faculty members to do research. So I think more in the states too, it it still has that student that student feel. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know. I mean, I don't have experience with a PhD in the states, so I necessarily don't know what you know exactly what it's yeah. like the strengths and differences. But for here specifically, it's much more, you know, you have to get, um, you know, your papers finished. You're kind of like your own, on, on your own timeline. You don't have someone constantly nagging you and emailing you. It's kind of like if you want to, you know, get these things done and published and teach, mm-hmm. you have to really go out there. So I guess being here has really taught me to go after what I want within the field. Mm -hmm. So, cause people aren't like everywhere you go, people aren't just going to hand you things. So I've really learned to, you know, when I want to teach somewhere, I take the initiative. When I want to teach a certain course, I do that. When I want to give a lecture or presentation, I do that. So um, here we're specifically required to publish one article before we have our PhD. And we're also supposed to have one in review. So I know that's very different than some programs within the States. So it's much more research, I think, heavy than um, like all the course load. So we only have to take... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we're only required to actually take three courses here. And I know a lot of uh, my master's uh, professors, they would say, you know, that's not a lot of course content. And it's really not. But I mean, we're so focused on what we're researching and then also like collaborating with other universities to teach. So it's it's more, I think, research driven and more getting out there and disseminating what you're doing and teaching other um, other universities Mm -hmm. or with other countries rather than us sitting in a classroom. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's important, and we you know, take the basic classes mm-hmm. in that area, but it's much more... Um, it's nice we're to not, mix. We're, Yeah, we're very much more like moving. Yeah. So all of us come from so many different places all over the world. So you know, half the time, 
I might be in the States doing research or one of my other colleagues is in Brazil doing research or the mm-hmm. other one's in Sweden. So we're, you know, we're very respectful and very supportive in that area. Cool. Um, and, you know, when our, our colleagues are kind of out and about doing their own thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I haven't heard, I'm sure there's somewhere, but I haven't heard of many places or any that like are structured that way in the States. That's just be so different. No. Of a- and they really accommodate to, you know, the PhD students. We try mm-hmm. to accommodate you know, when courses are being given to have as many of us here as possible and able to, and able to um, communicate and learn from each other yeah. because, you know, we're constantly all out in different areas, researching specific areas that other people don't really know about. Um, and one thing that we do, um, we're trying to do more of is having these joint lab meetings. So for example, last semester I was in Ingen's lab, some of our research that we were working on, but also giving some of the students because they have, you know, bachelor's and master's students within those specific areas who may not know a lot about early intervention um, or EIBI and those sorts of um, treatments for children with disabilities. So I went into that lab and was actually able to present on my research and some of the cost benefit analysis of um, EIBI and a lot of people obviously were pretty stunned with some of the results and percentages so it's just it's it's always good to jump into other areas because obviously we're all working together we're together on a day-to-day basis but Mm -hmm. some people just don't know what anyone else is doing and I think it's it's amazing and I think it's very important that we're all kind of aware of what everyone else is researching because we're always all trying to collaborate, you yeah. know, and spread the word about our yeah. research and the importance of it. Yeah. So cool. So it's a very different system. Uh, everybody's everywhere. And so how do you handle juggling all this stuff at once? Oh, I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean it's it's stressful, but it's it's also it's never like a bad stress it's always that i want to keep doing more so Mm -hmm. even though i'm researching specifically conditional discrimination training procedures i'm also trying to stay up to date with you know various webinars or various conferences so you know i tapped into watching the convergence conference Mm -hmm. online so i was watching that and very fascinated with all the animal training I'm doing webinars, trying to train or trying to travel for different uh, teaching and training yeah. uh, workshops. So I think it's just it's it's always an exciting time, I think, to be a behavior analyst yeah. and to like be able to dip your toes into the different areas mm-hmm. that I wish I had more time in the day. Yeah, um, I think everyone is yeah. busy. Everyone has the same 24 hours. But at the end of the day, I my to do list for the next day is just it's usually multiple post-its yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there's just so many different areas I want to read up on and learn more about, but also staying um, onto the topic that I am going to be defending my PhD yeah. on in that area that I'm really focused, focused in on. All right, Brittany's contact information is linked down below. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. It actually makes a difference. So please help out tomorrow. It's related to the field. Yeah. Maybe get people talking a little bit more. Yeah, that's so, nice. That's your daily BA.